Okay, welcome everybody. Glad to have you all here. So what I'd like to show you today is how to actually create content management for your customer that's fun and it's also fun for you. And so thank you for being here and thank you for our sponsors uh, because as you all know, um, the big work of course is done by Peter and Vincenz and all them, but without this it wouldn't work either. So this is my first goal today that you are empowered to make amazing content management for your customers. And we want to focus on real value. So when we're talking about amazing content management, we're not talking about the tools. The tools are there, and we're going to talk about the tools, of course. But the true value is not the, the tools themselves, but what the customer gets. And of course, it must be super easy to use, and it must be cost effective for you guys. And the last bit, my third goal, is that some of you already know Too Sexy, that you will be inspired to use some of the more powerful features for even more wow. Now if you look at content management from a holistic point of view, now I assume most of you are, have a technical background. Who in here is like front-end or back-end developer or something like that? Most of you. Who of you has ever made a content plan for a website with maybe a hundred pages just planning the content and the messages that will be on it. Who has ever done that in here? A few of you. Great. Because that's actually where things get kind of difficult, right? The, the, the technician tends to think that if there's an input dialogue, that's content management. But in reality, there's way more to it and just inputting the stuff is just a tiny little bit. Okay, we have another visitor. That's, uh, he's just being scanned. Hi, welcome. So if we look at this, I mean the challenges our customers actually have are beginning with the content strategy, the content plan, planning each little bit. And of course, small customers will not have a lot of resources for this, but the big customers really care about this. And of course, in classic DNN, we would have a text HTML which can just do this little bit and we're more interested in the larger picture here. The whole content life cycle, multi-language content management, cross-media, responsive content, which text HTML simply would never be able to provide. And if we look at this from a really holistic point of view, there's, there are so many stakeholders. So of course we have the end user who wants the website to work. We have the editor who will be working with the content. We have you guys in different roles here. Is anybody from sales here? One, two, three. Because sales, especially if the team gets a bit bigger, has a lot of challenges too involved with this because the customer will say, can I do this? And how much is it going to cost me? And if there is no clear way how it's going to be done, the sales cannot just say yes, that's like a half a day's job. And of course, at the end, the business owner. So let's, I've just put out a few needs and expectations for these, for these groups. Um, so the content editor, for example, he really needs something like a page builder because anything else is not going to solve it. If, if he's supposed to make a landing page with a cool picture on top and a standard look with a call to action button, then with some highlights, another call to action, he needs a page builder. Um, he needs to be able to focus on his things and not worry too much about all the other bits that should just work. Life cycle is extremely difficult to handle if the tools don't support that. And with lifecycle, I mean, usually we focus on the initial content entry. And of course, that's kind of easy to do. But as soon as you start maintaining content, you'll start having pictures that don't match up. You'll have some languages which still have an old information, another language which has the new information. And things get really hard to manage. And of course, the content editor always wants content inside of content. Meaning, he just wrote a blog post, but now in the blog post he would like to add a gallery or a contact form or something, and he needs that. And the idea is, of course, that this should not be a lot of work for you. The front-end developer, that's what many of you will be having as a role, has a lot of needs as well, typically a lot of cost pressures. So you also need most of the work to be pre-built, just so you don't reinvent the wheel every time. And you need to be sure that if there's something really cool you found in the internet, you can use that. 
without a lot of hassle. So you found a very cool JavaScript gallery or something, you just want to use that. If we keep on going, the visual designer has a lot of needs as well. And one of the first or, or biggest challenges nowadays is designing content first. So in the old mode where you would just have a page and you would just be dumping stuff on it, um, the, the idea that you're actually, that this page is all about one single message and like getting things above the fold properly and, and, and segmenting the content that when it gets responsive, it still has this content first design. That's something that the designer wants to do, but is very hard if the tools don't support this model. So for example, if you use panes in DNN, this isn't going to work. Um, sales, one of his core challenges will be estimating work without having to be a developer in the, to just do that. Um, and sales has a big challenge that they're always under cost pressure, right? The customer always would like it a bit cheaper. And if the sales can get into the point where they sell the value of what they're going to do instead of the effort that is needed, they can price things in a much better way and also make a profit for the company. We'll look at a little more of that tomorrow in the session, amazing companies are like software. Um, the business owner, of course, he somehow wants to control the whole chaos of production, versions, cost, etc. And one of his biggest financial risks are actually the post-production costs, if you look on this list, because the post-production cost is typically that where you think, now we're done, and we were just in time and in budget. And you hand it off to the customer, and somehow, two months later, you're still working on the project. And I know everybody here has had that again and again and again. And that just completely ruins every profit. <laughs> so let's look at content editing as it is today. Text HTML is pretty useless. Uh, it doesn't actually do much that we can use. Pain's our problem. Um, for example, just for those who are not aware of that. Yeah. Hello, welcome. Um, if we let our editor put things side by side because the panes are side by side, then at the moment it becomes mobile, it's not going to match up anymore, as a simple example. If we try to let the customer place three boxes side by side by giving him three panes, then as he works with it, under that he's going to need a full pane again, and then he's going to need another three panes, and it just becomes a very, very messy template. Editing is very slow, so just even switching into edit mode sucks. Um, and training our customer is very difficult because he'll typically have a lot of modules just to get something simple done. Then comes the module evaluation hell. So the customer just wants something simple, and you're like, yeah, this should be done in two hours, and you realize there's one more need and one more need, and then you start having to evaluate which module in the store could actually do it. So in reality, you're already burning up the whole budget just trying to find out what module you could use. And then you think you found it, but since it's so different from anything you've used before, they have their own ideas of templating, it doesn't have some features, the real cost is really high, and the next upgrade of DNN is going to be inc incompatible, you're going to need a new module, you're going to burn money again, and this is actually all you're getting paid for. And we've all been there. Because system life cycle, yeah, we all know it. At one point, you're going to have to update. The module isn't going to be supported anymore, or it's going to conflict with another module. And it's just going to take you so much time and money to fix things that you won't be able to charge the customer. Because he'll say, come on, was your first work so bad? And not fun. And of course, one of the big challenges also is we know something is coming. We're not, we're not at the end of the road. In our case, it's .NET Core. And one of the core challenges there is that if the customer trusts me as a person to provide him with a good solution, then I really can't come in two years and say, what I just built for you two years ago was like 10, 20 grand, or maybe it was just $1,000, depends on whom. But if I then come and say, you're screwed. Everything I did for you isn't going to work anymore. That's, of course, a breach of trust. And we find that unacceptable. So, of course, we have to have a way to go ahead without that. So let's look at it. And look how this can be done in a really cool and fun way. I'm first going to show you briefly how 
this whole thing feels for the content editor because he's the person we're trying to please at the second level. The first level, of course, is his customer, his end user. But our core focus is to get that guy happy. And then we're going to look at how to get you guys happy as the developers, how easy things are there. Um, I'm going to explain a few of the strategies and philosophies behind Too Sexy because very often when people think, why does this not work? It actually works, but there's a good reason why it doesn't work that way. We're going to look at some uh, advanced features and we're going to go back to review how we're creating value for all the stakeholders we talked about in the beginning and give you kind of the first steps to get started or to go deeper into this if you've already been using it before. So let's do some live demo editing. And so what we have here is a website we made for a customer about two years ago. So even the things that you're going to see right now, these are old already. But I'm not trying to show you rocket science. I'm trying to show you how to make this a pleasurable experience for the customer. So as you see, I'm not in edit mode. And I'm just going to go ahead and start building a landing page for a certain topic. So this is uh, labeled in German, uh, most of it. So don't worry about it. And the newer versions also have a preview. But as you can see, with two clicks, I just added this designed header section. And maybe the customer says he likes this one, or maybe he'd rather have the smaller one because it's a different kind of landing page, but let's take the big one for now. And I can start editing it, but let me just kind of prototype the page first a little bit to just see that the, the feeling that, that this page will give us. So we'll, in here, we'll now add a link, maybe something with an icon, something like this. And as you can see, the, the, the editor will just be able to click around and say, this is what I want. And he can now go in here and say, OK, this is good. Let's add something to it and say, yes, 2018. Mm, he wants to love this. Um, he can add a link. He can add some text here. And this is the German um, edition at the moment. So I'm going to write mir. And so this is it, very trivial. And it doesn't show the link at the moment because we don't have one. And you can also see it's very fast. One of our core goals in everything is this. If somebody is working on something and he has to wait, even if it's just a few seconds, his mind will start drifting off. We've all had this. He'll check his emails in the meantime. He'll quickly have a conversation, and he cannot stay focused and in this, this flow of getting something done. We also know this when we're developing something. If the compiler takes too long, we tend to start to doing seven things at the same time and doing nothing right, and we lose focus. So it's really, really important that this is just fast and fluid. Or, for example, if we're now going to look at the multi-language thing, just so for a short um, explanation here, in most cases, you can just say, keep it linked to the original language. This helps a lot with life cycle because, for example, if you replace a picture in the first language, it will also be replaced in the following languages. But, of course, there may be things where you say, okay, this is, um, uh, this, of course, should be more yep. instead of mir. But the link should be the same, again, for life cycle reasons. And it's very trivial. Now let's uh, make this a little nicer. Um, let's add a split section here. Uh, this diagonal line here, just to make the page a little uh, nicer. Um, then we'll add some more, maybe a, an intro text or something. Without a picture. And now we're going to add a list of links, something that looks nice, maybe this one here and we're going to say we, we, we want a few of these so we're just going to prototype this still and just add a few more blocks and see that for example here he automatically gets paging and all that and, and this is all 
very elegant because to show your customer how to do this is simple. And he cannot break it because he can, of course, edit something. But that's it. He can edit it. He can drag and drop pictures into here. Right? He can just do that. Or, of course, he can also upload it with, with buttons. Um, so it's, it's all very simple and in a flow that the user understands. And if he needs some more sophisticated functionality, for example, let's add a call to action. In this specific project, we added something special that when a user enters the site, we're keeping track of which pages he was on. And we made a special call to action app, which will, based on his previous pages he was on, show him a different consultant while he's still browsing on other pages. So it's like we, we know he's from Germany, so he should see the German consultant, or he's from Switzerland, he should see the Swiss guy. He was apparently more interested in this kind of service, so he will see that person for that service. And this is all in the same mechanism. And as you can see, this is easy to train. When we train a customer, it's usually about two hours for just about any website. And that's it. And we barely ever show them the edit mode. You see, I've never, I was never in the edit mode. Maybe I don't want this white line, so I'll delete it here. I will, again, not go into edit mode just to remove something that is a DNN module. And this is just very simple and elegant to work with. So, can you do like anything like that with another DNN module that you've ever seen so far? No. <laughs> Thank you. So, we just saw it. Very simple content editing, fast front-end editing, multi-language lifecycle. And the single pane thing is extremely important if you want to go content first. Because it's the only way you can actually control that the editor will input something that will look the same on all devices consistently because he's forced to think about the reading order, which he doesn't do if you give him multiple panes. It's, from the design point, unbreakable. Uh, what I didn't show you yet is that pictures will get automatically resized and all that. Um, it's responsive by design, and it's the design you guys make. Um, I didn't demo the inner content yet, but I'll show that a little later. Uh, the retina images, again, we, we have a very simple setup to make sure the images also look great on high high resolution displays, which you otherwise won't get because they will start looking pixely on the, the newer devices. And he has a website builder experience, which is just, it's just so simple for him. And yeah, uh, as far as I know, this is really unique. Nobody else does it like this, even close. So let's look at you guys' experience. Let me just check the time. We started at 20 past, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So let's install this. Um, I just made a brief video so that we wouldn't have to watch me click all this through. But basically, the installation experience is pretty straightforward. It's a DNN module. You install the extension. You wait for it to, to, to install. And of course, DNN will tell you that your connection might be slow To Yeah, we all know that. Um, and once it's installed, it's going to ask you whether you want to use the standard content templates, which are like standard picture combinations and standard things like that, or whether you want to use your own. Because we recommend to always just use the defaults, but maybe somebody has already set it up in their company um, so that they have their own preferred sets of parts, and then, of course, they won't use the ones that we recommend. And then we don't want to clutter up the database with things you don't want. The quick thing? Uh, yes, it is, because we're going to need that for a demo afterwards. <laughs> yes? I just said that because David loved that. <laughs> <laughs> so here we're going to install the recommended package. So that's the, the standard bits and parts. There's a blog post. You can see what you get. But again, if somebody has their own themes or their own parts, they can install that instead. Because now that it's installed, you can now start adding Things. You can now say, I have a picture content type, or a separation thing, or a link bar, add things. You also see this is the newer version. That's why it has preview pictures for, for all the bits and parts that I selected, which in my last demo wasn't in there. Yeah. So that's the whole installation experience. Yes? Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. Something I always, uh, 
I don't even know why uh, I am so irritated about it. The fact that you have to install the uh, the recommended package. Yeah. Because you can't get out of that, right? You always have to install a package before you can continue. No, no, you could just start from uh, create your own content types and go ahead with that. I never, I somehow I never got got that screen wiped when I yeah. install uh, too sexy. It's always like you have to install for something first before I can even get to the admin. Okay. Um, I must admit, since we never do that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Yeah, it used to work. Yeah. Um, I, it may be that the, 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 the admin button isn't available at the moment. We, we, we might have missed that. So, okay. yeah. Well, it's just something I wondered. Like, it's, it's handy to have those standard packages, but sometimes you only need one kind of content and you don't want to download the whole bootstrap uh, yeah. thing. So I was like, is that something you just don't want uh, to do or is it not all Not at all. Maybe the button got lost at some point and we just never noticed it. Okay. <laughs> okay, and yes, just feel free to ask questions if you have anything else. No problem. So, if you install this, you get, of course, the entire system with thousands of features. You get the view mode editing, you get the typical content types, the views. And this is already based on Bootstrap 3 and 4 at the same time. That's very important because we just, we're transitioning to Bootstrap 4, but we knew if we would make a, a new clone of this stuff in Bootstrap 4 only, we would have a lot of issues with like existing sites needing something or newer sites needing something, and you'd always either be running in parallel with two systems or older customers could not get new features and all that would suck. So. It's always Bootstrap 3 and 4 at the same time, built with SAS. Um, I'll show you a little bit more of that later on. And if you would spend another two minutes, you could install a whole bunch of like other components that work the very same way, whether it's the blog app, image compare app, things like that. So yeah, basically within a few minutes, you have a setup which already works <coughs> and has all the features you just saw. So let's make some changes the way you guys would do it. And as a first simple example, we're going to say we have a website right now which has one theme. We're going to switch themes. And since it's Bootstrap 4, a lot will already look right, but some colors may not be known yet. So let me just show this in a second. So, what you see here is actually the site that I was using to install Too Sexy for the, for the brief video. You can see it's currently using our Bootstrap 4 instant theme, which has a purple default color. So the buttons and everything are purple. The, the text, the links are purple. And this horizontal bar is also purple. Now, I'm going to switch themes to David Poindexter's theme. There we go. It should switch themes. There we go. And since both, since since it's Bootstrap 4, and since his theme also contains the koi file, which which publishes that it's Bootstrap 4, it just automatically works the way you'd expect it. So the colors already adapted, the links adapted, all that is great. Now there's one little bit missing, because certain things may change from theme to theme that are not so obvious. For example, breakpoints are are an issue. So if we would have like a styling which says how wide this bar is based on certain breakpoints, or specifically like our bar is still purple. You may not notice it from where you're looking, but this is still purple. And that's because it doesn't have a, a specific bootstrap class here to make it purple. It has its own class, which was, built, which was generated in SAS. So typically, if you're working with Bootstrap, that's how you work. You work with SAS, you have a bunch of variables which tell you how wide the gaps are between elements, what the arrangements are at certain breakpoints and all that. And so if you want to adapt this, oh, let me just stop that for a second. Then this is now the, the folder which contains all these content templates from before. I'm going to show you a bit more about the code later on, but 
these are just simple uh, razor files which just show, which just contain the HTML for the parts. Now, if we want to make sure that we can have the official colors in our theme, in our components, all we have to do, there's this bootstrap for SCSS, which will point, point to the variables of the skin. And so, of course, in my case now, since we've been using the purple one before, and now we're going to go to use David's theme, we're now going to uncomment these lines. We're pointing to his bootstrap files, to his variables, etc. And now we're just going to run, I'm going to save this, and we're going to run a gulp task, start bootstrap 4. It's going to rerun the SAS now using the variables of David's theme, or of your theme, or whatever. And now all the CSS is regenerated to fit to that. So if you're working the way Bootstrap is meant to be used, you can like proliferate this information across all the apps and all the components with just a few gulp processes. So right now this line is still purple. If I refresh this now, I think I need to do a control F5. So it's not quite working yet. Maybe the gulp has to pick it up again. There we go. Now it turned red. Sounds very trivial, right? But the thing is, the more things you build, if you have a blog app which will have to resize properly based on the breakpoints and things like that, then you really need the setup. And if you want to work, let's say, in the modern way of website creation, you need to use these automations like SAS and Bootstrap and all that. It's, uh, I believe there is simply no more room to brew your own systems for this. You just need to stay within the standards because then all the other tools can help you also stay within the standards and just be extremely productive. So we have the demo and this pattern to, for the design we use everywhere. So yeah, if you use the blog app, run SAS, everything will match your setup on the theme, all the colors, all the spacing, all the breakpoints. And it's just a really fast way of producing things. Now, let's take another example. I'm going to extend something with another field for another image, just together with you. So again, not a, not a big deal. But I just want to make sure you really see it's, it's all very trivial. So we have an information block here. And at the moment, if I go and edit this, or I'm going to reuse content I've added previously. I don't know what Mark is sharing, sharing, but. Ah, good, yeah. I always have to stop the presentation, because otherwise it doesn't work. Thank you. Okay, yes, you can see it now. So here we have a, a content item. It's again a list like before, so I could like add more things and it'll of course work the way Bootstrap expects it to. And I could now type in something new, just enter my name and all that, or I can reuse content because maybe I've already used my profile somewhere else before, so I'm just gonna pick me from an existing item, inserted here. So here I am on the list and now I'm like saying, okay, the customer would also like to have a logo of each person in there. So of course we're still missing some fields and we'll just go in here and say, I need another field logo. And this should be a link or a file reference. And let me just move that up here to the photo. And if I now go and edit this, I now have another field logo, which I didn't have before. And this is the one second flow experience I'm talking about. You're click, 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 and it just does what you expect it to. And you don't wait a minute for each reload and things like that. So let me add a logo. So it's in there. And of course, it won't show it yet because it wouldn't know where. So if you want to um, edit the template, you can use the built-in editor, you can use Visual Studio Code, you can use Visual Studio, whatever you want. I personally love using Visual Studio Code because it'll allow me to git version everything that I do and stuff. But for a lot of quick changes, you just quickly go into here and there are so many snippets this thing will give you. So let's say for example you wanted to kind of know how do I find the user's first name, well then just go here and say first name and you can show the user's first name here. 
So this is extremely helpful because there's so many things you won't remember how exactly it is done. And in our case, we're just going to add the person, the, the picture. Um, so let's say here, oh, I already actually added the tag from before. Okay, so probably did it already pop up? Yeah. Ah, okay. That's because that's uh, leftover. So actually, I just would have added this together with you now, um, but it's already here. So, yeah. So basically, you would add an image. You would then go and say, yeah, you just want... Um, you could say, you can pick fields from here. It'll also give you additional snippets for creating... Uh, let's just say, let's just say we want to just make a thumbnail. Um, so here would be a, a snippet that would create a thumbnail. Let me see if you, if I can zoom in a bit. Uh, is that? No, it's not. Ah, it is zooming, but not much, not very useful. Okay, so because it has an imagery <coughs> sizer built in, you can just add question mark, width, height, etc., and it's going to do that for you. So basically, as you can see, even these kind of changes are super fast to make and very easy to maintain. And, and that's why we say 80% is already done. Just install the default components. And then the customer will say, OK, I like the blog, but I just need another two special features. No problem. Just add a few more fields. That's fine. And the other guy will come and say, OK, I like this, this, this image gallery, but I need each picture to have seven more pieces of information, and they should be overlaid on the picture, on mouse over. You can do everything. It's just HTML, JavaScript. This thing just makes sure the data is there, the user flow is there, everything works. Yes, and all the output is completely under your control. So if, if you know HTML and JavaScript, you can do anything. And there's also a purpose to that. Some people keep on asking us, well, could you add this in this feature? Like, could you add this script or something to do sexy? And we're like, no because the engine shouldn't do that. If you have an app that should do that, sure, go ahead and do it. But it shouldn't be part of the engine, because otherwise we'd have to maintain it for years to come, and people would think that's the only way to do it. So keep out of the way. This we just looked at briefly. Um, yeah, very low learning curve, um, has pre-built best practices, even uh, snippets for Koi. Koi is that solution we made to make sure that uh, something can be Bootstrap 3, 4, Foundation 6 at the same time. And that's really great because when people start with something, it's just in there. Yep, there's help texts. There's sometimes links to additional wikis or whatever if you don't understand something. And you can use any other code editor as well. So, welcome. So, let's look at some numbers if we're talking about this. We at 2SIG, when we make a website, and let's take the most basic example. You have some kind of a tennis club, or you have an event that's a one-time event. You're just going to run this for two months. It doesn't need a lot of design. Of course, it has to have the right colors, the logos, and everything. But a very, very, very basic website is two and a half hours of work, two hours of training, and we usually plan with another two hours for follow-up support questions on the phone and things like that. So a very basic website, total production time, two and a half hours, and it's already custom then, and he has the full experience you just saw. And total internal cost, six and a half hours. And I believe there's no system out there, at least not on DNN, that can be so fast and give that kind of an experience. If we do crazier stuff, usually we spend more time consulting the customer, of course, because typically we do want to consult them. And depending on how big the packages get, of course, it goes upwards. But adding multi-language, for example, is super trivial because it's just in there. In many cases, it's just enabling the language. Zero time. And, of course, with the yeah, very crazy websites, um, then, of course, the, the effort can go up. But it's all work in regards of consulting, in regards of designing and making the HTML, and not in the tooling. And I think that's really the amazing bit, because you don't, the, the training doesn't go up. It's just all the same and simple. So this is my team. Um, I like to introduce myself in the middle of the presentation somewhere after people already feel like they're getting tired and 
they're not going to walk out. So, yep, so we've been around for almost 20 years. Uh, we do .NET. Um, that's what we've always been doing. We do lots of JavaScript. We've been doing DNN since almost forever and SharePoint too. And we're based in Switzerland and Liechtenstein. So Liechtenstein's a country. <laughs> <laughs> what about myself? Um, I'm really from the jungle and I'm not the guy on this side. <laughs> so I'm 40 years old now. Um, my parents were missionaries, so that's why I grew up in the jungle. Um, when I came to Switzerland, I was almost 17. I couldn't speak German. I couldn't, uh, I'd never been to a, like, a real school, kind of. Um, and then five years later, I founded the company, so I have no degree, nothing. I'm, I'm just doing my thing. I've been architecting Too Sexy since 2012, and we've been doing a lot with Angular since 2013. A lot of Too Sexy is also uh, based on Angular. And right now we're actually working on an Angular 6 implementation of the main form. That should give it another speed boost and, 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 and it'll remove some technical debt because we're still using Angular JS. So yeah, I think we're on a good, good trip here. So I would like to now show you or, or discuss a few things about the core strategies because this is a lot of things I get work, uh, asked about. So the first thing I think I already mentioned, this one second vision, things you want to be in a flow of working something. You don't want to wait for things and you don't want your editor to wait. He should be able to focus on what he's going to say and just keep on going. Um, what's also important is we have a strong idea of how we separate the editor from the developer. Some people don't like that. But for us it's very important to say somebody designs this thing and somebody puts in content and there's a clear flow how that works. And that also determines, for example, which buttons on the toolbar are visible if you don't have design rights. We remove certain buttons on purpose because they're not meant for the normal editor. You can always override it, but the default is just a clear separation of rules. Too sexy should stay completely out of the way. It, that's why it doesn't try to make you do HTML in a certain way or to use certain JavaScript frameworks or whatever. The idea is that it's completely out of the way and also to be replaceable because we also know that one day the next two sexy may have something different or maybe maybe for whatever reason another product will come out which will be so amazing that we're like let's move I don't see it coming but it could and if that happens we want to be sure we don't have a lock in and that's why we're saying we just use standard razor for everything we use standard HTML standard JavaScript we don't invent the wheel there just to make wor your work easier because a lot of people say like, oh, I don't want to learn SAS. Couldn't you do something that I don't need that? And we're like, that's the world how it is. And if Too Sexy would do something for that, you would end up learning something different and you wouldn't even save any time. Um, we're extremely focused on providing value. So a lot of the features built into Too Sexy are actually completely hidden. You don't, you don't notice them. For example, the multi-language system is actually not a multi-language system. It's actually a multi-dimensional data storage for one single field. And a dimension could also, instead of a language, be something different. And that sounds very complicated and you don't need to worry about it because we don't publish or announce these things because you wouldn't care about it. You want to look at it as a multi-language implementation. You want to get your problem solved and that's how it should be. And our, our real core focus, a lot of features that are wished for, we always postpone them first because we're like, it doesn't make sense to implement that right now. It needs this and this and this thing first because otherwise it's just not going to be a good solution. Um, so simple, then this DAFT acronym uh, is important to us too. Here's an example, one of the many asked for features is a form builder. Now. I presume all of you have used form builders, whether it's DNN Sharp or Mandeeps, etc. And the typical problem is this. The form builders make something that is very easy to do in HTML even easier. You click your way around. But what quickly happens is that these form builders start having all the terminology of HTML. You'll be able to add classes to a tag, for example, which is not really a business thing anymore. It's very technical. And you'll be able to do things, but suddenly they become extremely hard, and there's always one or two features missing. Always. 
And so what happens is you kind of save a lot of time at first because you're using the tool and it just works. But you hit the point where you suddenly use way more time than you would have used if you had just done it in HTML to circumvent something how the other form builder builds this thing. And that's why we're like saying, okay, like forms, forms are a hard topic. It's, it's a difficult thing. And actually most of you would actually fa uh, be better off just building it in HTML if you knew you can just store it like that. Because in HTML you have your CSS frameworks, you have, if you want a special effect like show hide something and you want to do it with an animation and the form builder doesn't do it, in HTML this is all fairly simple to do. So instead of creating a super tool that has 2,000 checkboxes to do something, just do it in HTML, that's what it's for. Too sexy can take care of the storage for you, the loading, whatever. But we try to not build sophisticated tools that in the end only techies can use anyways. We're very concerned about best practices, whether it's variable naming, using conventions, things like that. We spent almost a week to integrate Angular into DNN the right way. Because you can quickly do it within an hour the wrong way, but it just won't scale. What's also always been important to us is a loose coupling to the environment, so it's running in DNN, but it wouldn't have to. So about 95% of our code is .NET Core. Just the connection to DNN is still web forms, and of course it's going to stay that way, but if DNN X comes and is finally .NET Core, for us it'll be a very small amount of work to fix that. And the core idea is that you can mix it with anything. So all the technologies you want, all the tools you want, all the things you want. It's just an enabler with a lot of pre-built things in it so that you can get going more quickly. So uh, this is more of a time question. So I'll quickly give you an overview. Based on questions and stuff, I'll demo something briefly live. But otherwise, some powerful st stuff you may not know. <coughs> so there's the imagery sizer. Um, so I, I think a lot of you have already used 2Sexy, right? So the imagery sizer is built in and it's extremely good. It's from another open source project and it's really phenomenal. Um, just so you know, there's a very simple trick to go retina, which is if you take, if you, if you say the picture is instead of like a thousand pixels, you say it's 2000 pixels wide and give it a higher compression, it'll actually be just as heavy on the bandwidth as before but it'll have way more pixels and it'll look much nicer on the, on the, on the mobile devices. That's a, that's a cheap trick. There's a blog post about that from about five years ago, but I think most people don't know that yet. So then of course you can always combine it with the HTML image tag. Who's been using that? One, two and a half. So in the new HTML standard you can make a tag which actually has a few images in it and the browser will pick the correct one based on the, on, the, on the situation, based on the screen size and stuff like that. And it'll only pick up the, pi the pictures that it wants, so that of course is also great and easy to do. The inner content, that's where I can add content inside something. Um, I'll demo it after the questions. Multi-language, I already saw briefly, all the data is versioned. You can roll back to a previous version. You can see which fields changed. So that's very nice. And the Koi thing is something we released early this year. It's a standalone project. Uh, you could even use it on another CMS. It's not neither tied to DNN or too sexy. But it's the system of making sure that the theme can publish the CSS framework that it has and the components can pick up on it. Yes? And regarding versioning, you mean the content, not the package? Yes, the content is versioned, yes. Yeah. Um, then we have Atom, the automatic digital asset manager. That's what you were seeing when I just dropped in a picture and that was it. Because there too, uh, we believe that if you're managing content and not data, and there's a huge difference, then typically a picture belongs to something. It's part of something. And when you delete that something, you're also not going to want the picture anymore. So instead of forcing people to create folders for everything, it just takes it and puts it somewhere. And when you don't have the item anymore, the user should not know about it anymore either. WYSIWYG also has Atom, so the word mode you can also drop pictures in just like that, which is great for blogging and things like that. 
Then uh, the icon picker, you actually saw that briefly in my demo. You can use any icon font, font you want. You need to configure a few things, but then you have an icon picker with search. It's really cool. And it just immediately lets you build things that look really nice. The entity picker is something you don't need so much in the content, but that's for like saying the author is another piece of data somewhere, or the, the tags are from a set of prepared tags. And we have all these input fields, but all, a lot of these will not make sense in the content management mode. Those are more in the app mode. Like also like providing metadata and permissions for normal content, you won't be using that. So that's an advanced topic. And this thing here is one thing, it's like one of the hidden jewels, basically. This is the visual query designer. You can just drag a bunch of boxes together and kind of assemble your query, which will get data based on URL parameters or on the current user, and deliver them to the view and show them. And the view can both be a razor or it can be JavaScript because it'll also provide the query on a REST endpoint. So this sounds techy, it is techy, it's really cool. So let's just go briefly back to the question of value, because as we're focusing on the real value, we actually want to make too sexy so good that people don't even feel that it's there. And we're pretty close. It's just, just a flow. We also believe that if you restrict the editor and what he can do, you are creating true value. A lot of people think that the editor should have a HTML box and be able to insert snippets and we don't believe that. Um, easy and fast is real, real value. And not giving the customer design control is value. And we also believe that if you force yourself to work within standards, which may feel annoying at first, that's real value. So here's how you would get started. If you've never used this before, just install a new DNN using NV QuickSight on your computer and give it a try. So as you saw before, you're up and going in a few minutes. If you have a more strategic outlook on this, then we recommend that you first of all have a certain kind of a long-term strategy. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow in my talk uh, about the amazing companies are like software. But one of your core challenges will be that you need to standardize. And standardize means making decisions today that will work for a lot of scenarios. And that means you'll have to plan what are we going to do. If somebody doesn't like Bootstrap 4, are we really going to do that or not? Or are we going to optimize for one setup and become really good at that? Which is the version I would recommend. Um, you will have to figure out for yourself how your workflow is. Like, is the designer also the HTML person or not? I would recommend to design your processes as if they were separate, even if it's the same person, because it makes you more flexible as you want to grow. And one of the core points, we're going to look at this tomorrow in detail, is once you've standardized yourself more, you can start productizing your services. And that means you're going to sell, like, this is a blog package, and you can charge $1,000 for it, even if it only takes you five minutes to install. Because you're selling the product and the value instead of the effort you're investing into it. And we'll look at that way more tomorrow, because I think that's one of the key points to even make a profit as a service company, is actually not selling services. And then, of course, you'll want to review your processes. So this is the long-term strategy, right? This one's just getting started quickly, no problem. But if you want to look at this in a, in a, in a, in a long-term focus as a business, in, um, like strategic decision, review the process and implement them. Any questions so far? OK. So again, if we look at the stakeholders' need and experiences, the fast loading time we have pages that load within 0.2 seconds because too sexy caches everything. It's super fast. The page builder, the content editor is happy. We have a very low learning curve compared to anything else I've seen. Um, 
there's a really cool mobile editing feature. So if you're on a page and you're logged in, just shake your mobile device, the buttons pop up, you can edit, shake them, they go away again. Mm -hmm. So there's thousands of features you've probably never seen and is this is one of them. Now? Yep. Okay. Yep. It's just in there. Yeah. Right. And this solves the mouse over problem because you don't have a mouse over on, on your screen. Um, content in content, um, yes, most of it is pre-built. They can reuse just about anything. They can go content first. They can have any kind of design. And the sales has a much easier time because they know, oh, you want a blog with two special features. Oh, yeah, that's a standard blog, and it's a little bit of extra work. But it's not a two-day evaluation, creating specs, testing everything, looking at it. It's straightforward. It makes this part of the work much easier, and it makes this part of the work way easier as well. So for the, the business owner who would like to be able to pay the wages at the end of the month, this just gives it a certain reliability. And it removes most of evaluation hell and upgrade hell. And standardization also makes things much easier because you don't have to document as much once you've standardized. So no questions before, probably. Yes. I have a question. This is kind of a simple question. Sure. Like if you've never used too sexy, and like you're whipping around the screen and clicking on these little icons, but when you hover over them, there's not like telling you what those icons are. Do you have like a guide? Because, you know, you may not know what a button is, and you've got a lot of options. Yeah. Do you have a guide that like basically tells what you're clicking on? Um, so of course you can hover over it and you'll get a tiny tooltip. Well, I was noticing oh. when you did it, I didn't see it. That's why I was asking, like, how yeah, do you know what it's clicking on? Yeah, so I, I didn't wait long enough. Plus, I was, of course, logged in as a host user now. Um, as soon as you have lower privileges, you will not see most of the buttons that I just, that I had. Yeah. So there's no edit template button. There's no change the schema yeah, button. I mean, I'm not worried about a content editor. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> as far as setting it up. So I would yeah. be a host user saying all that. And uh, you can make uh, your, your buttons with the... Uh, with the tooltips uh, or a label, so okay. there is possible possibility to we'll bring that perhaps. Yeah. I'm, I'm considering leaving uh, <laughs> consider one of the Yeah. Maybe. So Stefan Kuhlmann uses Too Sexy a lot. He's actually one of our biggest <laughs> fans. <laughs> yeah. So Stefan Kuhlmann, who, who made Foreman List originally, yeah. he really loves Too Sexy as well, so I think that's an option. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and again, uh, tomorrow I have another uh, session, um, one moment, I'll have another session and I'd love to see you guys there because I think this may even be life changing for you. So yes, more questions. Uh, just one question about the Adam, uh, is, how secure is that, I mean are there, is it going to be pretty tested security wise or? Um, to put it this way, I believe yes. Um, and if you would, if you tell an ad, like if you have an app and you say the atom of that app is in the, what's this, the protected DNN folder thing, yeah. then of course you get that extra layer of protection. Um, I'm assuming you're more concerned about uploading of bad files. Yes. We invested probably over 100 hours just into the security of that. So I think we're very, very good there. Yeah, more questions. Where does your naming strategy come from? <laughs> <laughs> and is there any way to change that? <laughs> so now that it says 2SXC, it's um, <laughs> almost neutral. Um, Where does Koi come from? Is that from Koi fish? From fish thing. Uh, the Koi, Koi, the Koi is the fish thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the harmony thing, yeah. So that was just... Exactly, exactly. And to sex content was a lot of, after a lot of wine. <laughs> it, 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 it helped. <laughs> <laughs> to be creative. And there's a funny anecdote there because um, it was, I mean, previously it was too sexy content, right? It really had the word sex nice in it. Icon next to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. yes. Uh, and, and then when we made the website for the Vatican Bank and it was like, in the source code, you know the module names are in the source code, right? And yes. so we're like, ah, this, this could cause trouble someday. <laughs> so, I mean, seriously, is there a way to 
change the 2SXC without working and spending thousands of hours and trying to... I don't think so, but I would have to say the normal user will never see it. Yeah, we just have some clients that are concerned about that. So yeah. Nobody knows what it means, 2SXC. Uh, no, but 2SXC content, they, 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 most people find it a strange name if you talk about the module. Yes. Yeah, yes. SXC <laughs> is not that simple, so it's not, it's not an acronym that you... <laughs> so we sometimes cheat and say structured content, like structured okay. content. <laughs> but we like keeping it sexy, so we're not going to change it anytime soon. <laughs> yes, more questions. I have a technical one. Sure. Because uh, when you use your resizer, it works when you use it on templates and all that. But yep. when you use it as a, the atom in the twice a week, it uses style tag to resize if you try to make 50% width. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, it any, is it any plan to get the resizer in there? Is there any way to get so it? it's not on the roadmap. It is something we've thought about as well. Uh, it's just never bugged us enough that we would invest the resources. Well, so. it, bugged me, it bugged me yesterday, <laughs> another day, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but then I, I fixed the template, so it wasn't that big <laughs> yeah. thing for me. But mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a feature I was wondering if it was coming. Yeah. It was, would be quite nice just to drag it from. Yeah. <laughs> Three sizes would work. Yeah. So maybe a few infos which are not actually on, on the thing, but. Um, so right now, as I just said, we're working on um, Angular 6 version. And we're actually being helped here a lot. So Ante is working on this from Croatia. And that don't she did a lot of the refactoring for the now, a lot of the JavaScript is TypeScript now. So we're very concerned about technical debt and staying up to date. And so there's a lot happening there. And the, because we are rebuilding the input form, we've tried to slow down on any features in that at the moment because as we're building the Angular 6 version, it would just mean we'd have to write it twice. Uh, I get that. So maybe towards the end of the year, we could look into it again. Yeah. Yes? Um, I remember you have a great video on how to create content apps, token apps, stuff like that. Yep. Do you have something like that for uh, list and detail? I don't know. I've produced so much stuff, I simply don't know. <laughs> That's too bad, because I, I have the search, I didn't find any. Yeah. And just with the videos I did find, I always seem to crash somewhere between the visual query designer and the output. Yeah. <coughs> so I'm still looking for something as simple as to open the, the video. Okay. Then for apps. Yeah. Yep. Uh, there might be one, but I'll... I'll a couple of beers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. More questions? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Never tried it. Um, don't know. Good. And otherwise, um, I've been crunching some numbers recently and actually found out that somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of DNN installations today have too sexy on them. So that makes us really proud. Mm -hmm. And so please spread the word. And if you find some time, maybe even contribute something. <laughs> and otherwise, yes, go forth and be too sexy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>